I am for discipline. I am for clarity. I have invented the word la ville radieuse, which cannot be translated in English. He's usually quoted nearly everything that I have said, and not quite the way I said it. You're already all very welcome here this evening. Um, I'm very happy to say we uh, are welcoming uh, Johan Selsing uh, to give us a talk this evening, um, who he's been very kind to join us for a few days from uh, Sweden. Um, so uh, just to give a quick, out a quick introduction, um, Johan is, uh, aside from his own practice himself, he's the, princip um, he's the professor of design at the School of Architecture um, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Um, He's a visiting critic at many international colleges, Mendricio, Harvard, uh, London Met, um, and is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences as well as the Academy of Fine Art. Um, today he's here to um, speak to us about his work with his practice. Um, they have a body of work reaching back to the mid-90s. Uh, most notably, the most predominant work of that is uh, cultural and uh, university work, um, but more recently they've uh, been looking at uh, places of worship. Um, and the first building that I would have come across for Johans is the, um, the new crematorium um, at the Woodland Cemetery, uh, which is well known from Asplund's work. Um, in Johans' essay, uh, The Robust, The Sincere, um, he speaks about um, uh, his intention to engender uh, durable and multifaceted architecture while keeping intact a willfulness, audacity, playfulness, and even the naive. Um, so I look forward to seeing how he does that in his work this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation, both uh, Mike Dell and uh, Ronan McCann. I guess Colin Moore was, must have been involved early on in this. It's an honor for me to be here. And uh, I never, never really visited Dublin before, and on such a wonderful day, strolling from the, the guest house, I was put in this uh, guest house 31, I think it was called. I felt like a, a film star in this uh, 70s uh, sunken sofa at the, at the entry with a very exclusive sort of James Bond interior. <laughs> very, very fascinating. So it's great being here. Um, and I will. Um, as Mike said, I'm teaching in Stockholm. Lately I've been teaching in Spain, in Navarra, in Pamplona at that school. Uh, I've had a studio there for, for the last year. But um, mainly my work is in my practice in Stockholm. And uh, as I said, I, or the title of today's uh, presentation is Plans and Meters. Uh, I mean, always, you can always, how should you label what you will say? You can always say just recent work. but. Plans and meters is something that, uh, as you will see, I work very much with the plans of the buildings, and I will get back to that. And in that, as I've been doing that more and more, working on, on the plan and the abstraction of the plan, also the meters in poetry, I think, is very interesting. I think the, the, um, the, um, the aspect of uh, how these things could inspire each other is, or how poetry can inspire architecture is to me very interesting. So that's the reason but the title. Um, one could also label what I do as uh, an aim to do realistic craftsmanship, if you like. There could be many ways to, to present it. But today I will, I will try to focus on two major works that are pretty recent. One is this crematorium mentioned at the Woodland Cemetery in Stockholm. The other is a church just a few years ago, also in Stockholm. But uh, before the, presenting those, I will make a detour uh, into some other more recent work and ongoing work, and something very old as well. Uh, and But I will also touch on some things that has inspired me or text that I have written. And um, uh, as was mentioned, this text, The Robust, The Sincere, that's one text that I wrote some while back. Another is Rules and Rights. And Rules, of course, deals with the meters. And you know, our profession, or our discipline, architecture, just as, uh, as the poetry until, say, 100 years ago, it was extremely, um, 
sort of ordered in rules, whereas today it's a very different story, and I think that's an interesting, an interesting matter. So, but I won't be focusing really on that, but I could quote from this text, uh, the robust and sincere, about my work, um, saying that um, the robust is an alternative to architecture that is mainly based on visual features. The really significant qualities of a building are complex and not always visually accessible. They quite simply demand a different commitment or even presence if they are to be judged. The robust should not be interpreted to mean something crudely honed or therefore sturdy through its brute strength. Instead, it is intended to engender durable and multifaceted architecture. There are many factors that make architecture relevant in the long term, and appearance is only one of them. Robust architecture, as I see it, affirms the context of a project in the broadest sense uh, that goes for the, I mean, the, its physical concrete surroundings is one aspect of this. Other aspects are the technical conditions that apply to the project, its financing, the social context, its history or its current or expected social role. Robust architecture, in my, in my view, aims to determine the state in which all the circumstances can be scrupulously taken into account and synthesized uh, in the form of a building. When one or, or more of these circumstances change, the building will continue to be relevant, but now superimposed with its own historical overlay. The Swedish architect Sigurd Leverin's work uh, provoked thought in this context as they focused on the essential, the poetic, uh, you could say advanced experiments, but not as visually challenging buildings that demand the attention of those uh, who are not really affected by them. On the other hand, uh, those called upon to use them, I think, find them more interesting than most other buildings. Mm. But Having said that, a few, I mean, plans. This is the plan of this, the, the last project that I will show, the crematorium. Um, it's a crematorium. It's not a very public building. It is also a public building. But um, I will return to this plan several times. So that could be sort of the theme. But first, as little as I know of Dublin, why should you know anything of Stockholm? So just a few glimpses. You know, Stockholm is situated just in between the lake, the Great Lake Mela, which is really a system of lakes that sort of reaches the sea, the Baltic Sea. And to the left of the image is, of course, this very, very vast uh, archipelago that reaches almost to Finland. Um, this is the center of Stockholm with the old town, which was really where the lock was. So technically, this is the, the Sweetwater region. Here is technically the sea though it's not at all salt. But this is where the royal palace and the, the parliament is here. And this is the old center. And the two, the crematorium and the church of Orsta, are just south of this in the, should we say, suburbs. And this then is the central part with the, the royal palace, the parliament, and the waterway stretching eastwards uh, or westwards inland. Um, if I should just be very quick on to introduce my work, it could be maybe by a piece of furniture, which I do frequently. This park bench has the appearance of something hopefully straightforward, or even someone would even say austere, I don't know. But the uh, aim is to, to make it have a presence, but not being too loud. But in case you sit down, it does have a movable back so you could sort of swing. Actually, the title of the, the piece is Monk, from my interest in the swing pianist uh, Thelonious Monk. But you could sort of sit facing the sun or facing the street or whatever it is. And actually, the first time this was, when I saw these in a position, it was at the museum in Stockholm. And the, the, the director was standing. There was a great gathering of, of distinguished people for this uh, venissage. And I saw and this thing about moving pieces that in architecture, in buildings or in furniture, I think is quite, quite interesting. And I, I, of course, was interested in how they worked. And I saw these, these elderly people 
distinguished guests sitting on both sides of this bench, which was also, which of course it's not meant to be. So I could see their their completely discreet faces, but still their backs sort of striving for the best comfort. So not a sign in the face, but I could see how they were sort of fighting for for comfort. So the movable pieces in architecture but still in a building or in a piece which is relatively low-key, I think is quite interesting. Oops, sorry, that was too quick. But uh, I mentioned poetry, and uh, one, I mean, there are many poets that are, interest me, but one particularly is W.H. Auden, the British poet who, who, the quote is here, blessed be all the metrical rules that forbid automatic responses, force us to have second thoughts, and free us from the fetters of the self. I think it's a very useful quote also in our, in our work. And of course, Auden, who was born, I think, 1907, died in the 70s. He was a very interesting poet, very, I mean, a radical poet in many ways, um, and a, I guess a prodigy of, uh, of sorts, who then moved to the United States. But as radical, as, as uh, modern as he was, he was throughout his life extraordinarily uh, knowledgeable about the, the ancient meters, be they hexameter or uh, all, you know, Alexandrine, uh, Tertine, all these ancient meters that give uh, a rhythm to an ancient poem or to poems until recently. And I think that that kind of uh, straightforwardness, that for kind of rhythm is something that I think also I strive for in the work of architecture. And as you know, there are many poems from older times that we can, many people can quote, but contemporary poetry that, that lacks this kind of, um, that lacks the, the meter is unfortunately not so easy to, to uh, remember. You could even say the meter being a kind of machine to, to actually remember. And of course, before there was the, the written language, the meter was even more important. So, but I'll get back maybe to Orden. A few images from something way back. This is an art gallery. I did several art galleries um, in Sweden, uh, institutions, museum. This is a Carl Millis, this is in Stockholm. Um, an art gallery which is part of a larger museum. This is an art gallery for contemporary art which has an outside, an exterior, which is quite um, a contrast to its interior. And that is something that I frequently work with, that the, the exterior being part of its sort of uh, surroundings or that context, whereas the interior is meant to be appropriate for, for what's in, takes, what happens inside. So this is a more... So this is the exterior, the, outs, the surroundings of this project is actually a very well-to-do um, villa surrounding, whereas the interior is meant to be good and relatively um, sort of the background to the artworks. As you see, it's, it's almost white, but in fact, there are light treated floors that are sort of wooden. The steel parts are not white completely, which I think sometimes feels sort of strange. So they are sort of grayish, but so there are all kinds of hues of white, but it's meant to be quite a, quite a monochronous interior still. And there are some moving parts that you see the pieces are hanging. There are some sliding walls of considerable length that you can park next to the staircase over there. Another art gallery of a different kind is the central part of Stockholm, just by the main railway station. This is uh, the Bonnier Art Gallery. Bonnier is the major uh, Swedish uh, publish uh, house. And this is a 40s uh, industrial or offices and uh, printing shops down there. So here is a contrasting um, edition, which is though very closely attached in, in certain ways, particularly in, its, in the shape of the plan. So this is the new building which continues the, the, um, the block that is there and it curves with the street and it's, uh, it has different spaces in the art gallery but it's really a, a very um, transparent art gallery which of course raises questions uh, about seeing too much uh, around and so on. But uh, it it's could have been 
considered a kind of treasure box for this rich family's collection, which is not. It's rather meant to be an inviting uh, art gallery. Uh, but it's actually, oops, sorry. It's based on, on the existing brickwork of a terrace that was there before the building. And uh, on the inside, the materials are relatively low cost. This, this art piece on, the, on one of the early exhibitions is also, I mean, touching on this issue of the, the paradox of what is, what is cheap. And uh, this is, these are IKEA scales. I guess it touches on this issue of uh, the trivial. But in fact, a thousand scales from IKEA turns into the most expensive of all the art pieces of that, that exhibition. So, of course, what is expensive is, and what is cheap is uh, not so, so easy to, to know. But here you see the location. It's very close to the, to the major train station and by man, one of these many waterways leading inland. Another thinker that has been more and more interesting to me is, is Alberti and his quote that the greatest glory in art of building is to know what is appropriate. I think it's a very interesting statement and it's of course from his book, the 10, ten books on the art of building. And uh, I think it's uh, more and more, um, it has um, felt like a valid way to, to do work. We can do so, I mean, there are so many fantastic work, visual spectacles that are built, but finally it comes down to how appropriate you are on the economy of your client or the, the context of the site and so on. And, and of course, Alberti is, was a kind of architect, but he was probably more of, a, of something else, of a learned man of the, almost of the church. And uh, of course, the, the, this statement about the appropriate is, or as he wrote it, decorum. Decorum, I guess, is really something that comes from the virtues. And you know, the cardinal virtues being uh, moderation and um, what is it more, bravery, wisdom, and those. And uh, I think they're all interesting as also in architecture. I mean, what, and if when, uh, and of course, this goes back to the virtues, how Aristotle wrote about them. As, and each one of those issues, if we're speaking of generosity, what is generosity? It's sort of the middle ground between being a big spender and someone very tight-fisted. And, and, but you can never say what is, what is appropriate, what is, where is, so there's something in between. And what this is, finding the appropriate is not so evident or easy. And I think in our work, balancing all the things that we have to deal with into sort of between the extremes to the both ends is really what, what is at the core of our, of our profession, and many professions certainly, but, but also ours. So therefore, Alberti is mentioned here. But again, plans. I, I do, you could say that probably the plans is, um, has become more and more interesting to me. I, I, I have found myself working more and more with the plans with longer periods. And uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that it doesn't sort of diminish my interest in the appearance of buildings, of course. But it's just that I find a focus on the visual should we say, an insufficient or unreliable method to develop buildings. Uh, when you work with the plans, and I tend to work um, months and months on the plans, and then, but still, of course, there are things about the appearance of the building, the volumes and all these things that are, are, um, that are um, simultaneously thought about, but I think the abstraction of the plan is a wonderful way to think about all the, the parts of the building, all the spaces, be they uh, large spaces and how that should be arranged or very small and these, the groups of smaller space, smaller rooms compared to, to the very large ones. And to me, the good thing is that you could work such a long time on the plans and still without, you can still keep open the actual appearance of the building. And that gives a certain freedom that I think is interesting. That was a building for the state antiquarian offices and the traveling exhibitions. And that's in, actually in Gotland, in this island in the Baltic. 
I will not go deeper into it, it's, but it has here some very large-scale prefabricated concrete uh, elements. It's actually the whole is uh, prefabricated. Uh, and uh, the idea is to make a really um, deep relief on the facade. So the next image will show how this is achieved through this uh, silicone mold, this uh, Reckli, a German mold. So these are really quite deep. And that somehow, I think, connects, or my intention was that it sort of connect with the kind of geology at this place, Gotland, which has an extraordinary geology of limestone with sort of rauks, these strange uh, formations on the beaches. Another work which is now um, ongoing, it's actually located at a wonderful site uh, to the, in the west of Sweden. It's an art gallery, art little art center on an extraordinary terrain, dramatic, reaching into the sea. And there, of course, again, this thing about presenting artworks in the competition with a fantastic uh, place is something to be, to be worked on in the actual project. And in this case, uh, and it's actually a project that started 15 years ago, so uh, the uh, the previous image was really an idea about working on an interior of the building, a block which had not any or very little views to the outside, but rather having sort of projecting galleries hanging outside of the, the bulk of the block of the building. And this is now being developed and shortly to be built, though slightly smaller because of cost reductions. So again, the plan is quite compact. It's also, also a chamber music hall and some square spaces and so the long, a very long gallery, a square gallery, but all sort of enclosed in a block which has a few openings to the outside. But really what you see from the outside are these cantilevered uh, galleries that has to do with the exterior, that with the surroundings. So it's this combination to not to make the, the wonderful outside compete with the artworks. Uh, in the same region, a private house which has an odd plan and uh, here the uh, site which is just uh, 150 or so meters from the sea, from the shore, it's a wonderful location, um, and, uh, but the only thing on the site, there were some existing houses here that was to be torn down. But, uh, so then I knew the only thing that was really wonderful on the site was actually this chestnut tree. As you see, there's a heavy wind all through the year. So that was really what I wanted to build the house around. And I had this idea about a, uh, an atrium sort of courtyard theme for a house, which turned out very interesting and so on. But then for different reasons, one was that I understood that the, the municipality didn't much like new buildings, so it could be difficult to get a permission to build. The other was that the, the house turned sort of bigger by being having a big open atrium space at the center. It turned into somewhat large as a house on the site. It's a small fisherman's village. So then I instead turned to using the actual footprint of what was there before. Um, so the, uh, in fact, the, uh, this was an existing, the living quarters, the house of, the fam of a family it was deserted since long. And then there was an addition, some kind of workshop, and then there was a tractor, a garage or something. So this, the plan of this is then completely following the footprint of the existing. And I felt that would give liberated in some way, the plan, and uh, of course, the there is a you're not as secluded as you are in an atrium courtyard, but you can be at the at the back behind the big tree by sort of slightly enclosed there. You could be more open from the the, the very large living room, greeting guests and neighbors and so on. So it felt that this was a more appropriate solution at the site. <coughs> Uh, the, again, the appearance, the outside of the building is all oak, oak on the roof as well as on the walls, whereas the inside is, is a very uh, different, lighter interior. So you can get an idea that the sea is just a little bit away. Boy, is it more. 
So it's a one, most of it is a one story house. Inside here is the kitchen, but here there's sort of some, some play with scales because there's a staircase leading up to the one, the only one room, the master bedroom on the, above the kitchen. Uh, but then there's the children's, the grandchildren's rooms and the major large um, living room. So this is a summer house for a well, for a, for a um, well to do, for a rich family. Um, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> I, I, it's really very evident. Um, so this is the kitchen with a tiny little fireplace just at the circular table. Whereas when you reach the, the very large uh, living room, there is a spectacular fireplace facing two ways. One facing the major sofa, the other facing the reading room. And then there are some, it opens to the, to the top of the, the roof, the ceiling, and, but there are also some, so there's quite a, well complicated, but there's quite an articulation in the ceiling about some complete heights here and there and some other parts where there are beams bringing down light focused into reading areas or sort of half open to the, to the um, center. I cannot really explain it well. But. And there's also a pool space uh, next to the building that if, this, if the, the living house is, is uh, all um, wood, this is all uh, masonry. It's a brick building with glazed bricks. So it's, and it has it's positioned just next to, a sound, uh, to the pool, which is outside in between the big house and the pool house. And there's a little sauna. There's a place to be inside. And there are some sliding walls that can close off outdoor uh, evening place with a, even a fireplace, and then something opening to the pool. So you can sort of, uh, it can open and close as heavy as it is. It can sort of, uh, with the, the time of the day and with the time of the year, well, the pool is obviously here, it can uh, change. And here are some glazed bricks. The Swedish brick production is, is almost non-existent nowadays, but it's all Danish brick that we tend to use. But these are actually glazed in Stockholm. Um, so I think the glazed bricks is interesting. The weight of the gravity of brick combined with a kind of uh, with a, um, um, surface, the, the soft surface of the glazed is an interesting uh, combination, I think. Uh, speaking of plans and uh, even meters, this was actually something I wrote. This is a terzin. If, you, if anyone knows how the terzin, you know, Dante wrote in terzins, every third, every third line rhymes, and that creates the, the, um, the, the meter just goes on. And of course, this is not <laughs> this is no, not poetry, but it's poetry and architecture. Maybe this is Shinohara. Someone would spot. I think these buildings, this is a small building, but it has this wonderful abstraction and it could, you could interpret it in many, many ways. And I think that's one of the many advantages. You could work on your plan and different people will have different solutions to how an appropriate uh, volume will be. Before going into the, the real focus of, of the, the presentation, I will show you one contemporary competition that we did in Stockholm uh, for the Nobel uh, Foundation, which is a prominent Swedish institution, of course. And uh, they are having plans for a Nobel Center, which is a, a tricky project in many ways. Uh, but uh, it was an invited competition, and um, we didn't win. Uh, Chipperfield, we were in the final against David Chipperfield, who, who got the project. And uh, But I will show you just... Uh, and. His scheme is considerably different, but I will give you a few glimpses of how this is arranged. It's at the city center, just behind the National Museum, so it's a very um, central location, just by the water. It will, the, the, the questionable issue of this project is, one of the things is that they will move the, the, the major prize ceremony, which is today is in the Stockholm Concert House, uh, to this building. But that happens once a year, and they're building then, the plan is to build a 1,400 people uh, lecture room, which is pretty vast for 
using once a year. So that's one of the questions and that's one of the things that we had to deal with to sort of divide it into different parts and so on. But still, that's one of the question marks, I guess, on the project. But this is just uh, something, again, on the exterior versus the, um, the appearance on the inside. So this is a brick, a brick building uh, rising on top of a double height concrete socle, which has restaurants and public spaces and, and exhibitions. So in this phase is an, a new sort of open uh, festival kind of uh, area, area, area to the south of the building. And then further up are the major um, auditorium, but also many conference spaces and so on. But it's, so this is a light uh, finished brick, actually, it was meant to be. And then you see the openings, the austerity of the block, which is quite uh, definite, has then uh, a delicacy, I would say, in the treatment of all the openings that vary in proportions in, and, uh, and thickness of the walls and so on. So this, if I've been speaking about plans, which is something that interests me a lot, the other thing is, of course, sections, which is, uh, and this, certain buildings you present much better by a section than by a plan, and this is certainly such a project. So this shows this large hall for 1,400 people, and uh, we designed it like an amphitheater, and um, one of the major reasons was to, to have as few, just like this space, to have as few rows as possible so, so you could get uh, sort of contact with the, with the people, but also that the people between themselves would be, would sort of, when there is an atmosphere of, of a kind, you would be able to see each other as it's a sort of 180 degrees uh, arrangement. But the ground floor, the street is on this level, and there's a major hall here which has prefabricated uh, um, concrete um, beams crossing all over the, the, the wide space. And then some major staircases and there are other staircases. But the hall on the inside is a really a varied uh, interior where many spaces are sort of opening up. So if it's on the outside seems again somewhat strict, I think the inside it would be very rich. And of course, sort of crowning this was my intention to do a space which would be well lit with daylight, which is not so, and of course, you don't always need daylight in a, in a conference space, but when you need it, it's nice to have, to have really good daylight. So the space has three uh, large oculuses like this, and three smaller ones. So each of the three segments in the main room could be lit by this. You could even, you didn't even need much of other lighting. And that's a very different, the proposition by Chipperfield, which finally won, is a different story. It has, it's a double height almost of this bill, or a lot higher than this bill, but it has a, uh, the auditorium sitting on top of the building so you could see the city around. But to me, in such a conference space, the most interesting thing is probably to really focus on what is going on, what is being said, or what is being played, or whatever it is. Then plan. This is the ground plan, which is, has sort of almost sliding areas of, uh, of kitchens, in this case for the restaurant, and then the major um, foyer that you could reach from both sides that also has a sunken well at the center for the exhibitions that also rise on top of the kitchen and on the top of the ramp for the garage. And then some a library here and so on. So it's, it's pretty rich in its um, content in the plan. But uh, again, the, uh, the major thing, the major space inside the building is really this uh, auditorium. And I felt this was really important to, to make that into a particular space, but it also needed to be appropriate for the kind of division, divisionability, or whatever one would say. So, uh, to, so there could be sliding walls separating, then there would be one of these oculuses in each, in each room. And that's the plan for that, that um, level. And there could be, so this is technically quite easy to do. You store them in storages here and you drive them out. Um, but it's pretty, there are movable parts, but it could be done manually actually by a few people. And it's not so very advanced. In the plan, there are also double height spaces that reach 
in between the two levels outside and there's a very tiny foyer for the art or the, the lecturers on the back side. So this is the space and these almost sort of amphora shaped uh, oculuses I was quite interested in and that's meant to be uh, clad in, um, in wood and in sort of veneer of wood. So there would always be not just light from one, but light from two, you know, just not if you have light from one place, there's always a shadow. If there's, a, if there's light on the shadow, the, the light is much richer in a space. And here, of course, the, the dividable. Um, or something of further up. Um, actually, so here you would be you're pretty close to the rest of, you're very close to the rest of the city and the water is just down. And also we do, we, as everybody else, we do of course Photoshop images of all kinds, but, but we, I prefer to work really with the drawings and with large models. So we frequently do, this is actually a film, but I see it's not starting. So we do large scale, this was a one to 50 model, but for, we frequently do one to 20 and one to, 10 models that we take photos of in our competition entries and so on. I think that's a, that's a much better, I mean, the client can, a uh, layman client can sort of misunderstand a, a Photoshop image to under, believing it is almost built, whereas a model will always be understood on its sort of correct level, which I think is interesting. So, um, this is not the, obviously the crematorium, but I'll show you some, some work that um, brought knowledge to what was finally done at the crematorium. So this is a little private house, pretty compact plan, oops, uh, compact plan, um, and the client, also an exclusive client with uh, two, not so many, not so many, um, uh, demands, but one, there should be a pool where should, they should be able to swim laps, so 12 and a half meters that we felt was, was a good length. And I tested it, having it almost on top. If you think of uh, uh, Adolf Law's house for Josephine Baker, that was sort of a, an idea I had, which, which of course was, became pretty problematic. So it was better to put it in the, in the basement. Uh, and, but they also wanted a flat roof and a terrace overlooking the archipelago. So that's what it is. But as you see, it's a pretty compact building with a central staircase reaching from the entry uh, downwards uh, to the pool space, but also upwards to the, to the terrace and to the, to the, well, the terrace with the, um, the rooms. Um, <coughs> And it's located on a sloping terrain, so the pool space could actually open to the west, but also having light from the other side in a light well. But here we tested two things that were, we didn't know it, of course, at the time, but this is a, a brick, a Danish brick, the, which is, could be known f by you. It's uh, also used by, it's actually the first time it was used, it was by Peter Zumthor in the, in the Cologne uh, project, Colomba. So it's a very long, it's an unusual brick that was, that was um, developed together with Peter Zumthor for that project. It's 52 centimeters long and just 35, 34 millimeters thick. And it's 10.8 millimeters, uh, centimeters uh, deep. So it's a very long stone. And uh, here we worked on it as a kind of cladding on top of a concrete, so it's not a massive load-bearing brick structure, uh, but to indicate that there actually is a cladding and not a, not a load-bearing structure, you may see here that there are sort of seams, almost vertical seams as a, kind of, as a kind of dress on top of something else. And that is pretty elaborate on the whole facade to indicate this. Of course, a layman wouldn't maybe notice, but, but maybe an architect would. And to me, it was quite interesting to, to test that. Um, the interiors are, are um, it's not a very large house, it's a very exclusive house though, uh, but, so that's the living room. The, the pool space is a white concrete space and we, I felt it would be interesting to test 
and finally we got the client to to um, accept that so it's a concrete surface and it's a white concrete it's not white through pigment it is white uh, through um, uh, using a, a, a Danish white cement all white cement and the ballast is dolomite cross so whatever you do to the to the concrete it will be white and uh, what my intention was was to give this this very sort of uh, strong material the uh, kind of gentle should we say appearance and also in a pool space you may be with no clothes and you should be able to lean against the, the walls and so so i wanted it to be very sort of soft if one could say so uh, and but still also show how the production of the building had been so nothing has been done once the, the form work has been dismantled and that was the tricky thing and and but luckily it was done and it's uh, it worked and of course you see and the idea is that you will understand through the edges of all the forms how this is done but there's no after work done this is out west so it's both the the roof the even the sunken parts of the the pool is, and this actually is a staircase leading up so there was a space underneath that I didn't want just to make into a cupboard so it turns into a openable with this circular hole and you could store some stuff or the kids stuff inside there so the the, the one of the drawing rooms and the further up in the house so the outside again is relatively quiet whereas the interior is more varied and as you see some several of these works have they're, they're traditional in some sense and I think that this quote of Mahler that the tradition is not the worship of the ashes but the handing on of the fire I think is an interesting quote that that you try to to not to to sort of copy how things were done in the old days but sort of bring forward what is actually what is good what is important and I think that's an interesting statement so that brings us to the church that also was uh, certainly a work an important work it was a competition as most of these works are but it was a uh, a work which also certain things were tested that were used in the crematorium but the church is it's the Swedish church which is now separated from the state until just uh, just since just a few years actually but it's in a suburb to Stockholm it's in a suburb to Stockholm uh, from the 40s very typical with these um, houses uh, sometimes in the 50s they tended to be in brick but um, in the beginning they were even flat roofs and white later on this time they were usually not white and the, the there were pitched roofs and from the 60s 68 there was this parish building that had no church and there was a competition for the church and i suggested uh, a relatively block-like building next to it as a separate volume uh, and when i won the competition the client was very um, they urged me or asked me to to combine the both both these buildings into one for practical reasons and i felt it was a there were many good arguments for this particularly that also we could move in toilets and and uh, things for the wardrobes and things from the church into the existing building and, and save space to other things and costs and so on. so finally they merged into one and um, this building this is actually a brick though clad in not very interesting bricks in the 60s uh, and the new building had intent my intention was that this could be a contrast it could be a red and white building in concrete it should be quite inexpensive but when they asked me to merge it the, the, the two I suggested that the new building should also be bricks because why stress what is new and what is old when they're sort of linked together so now this is all brick though it's it's a massive load-bearing brick structure it's uh, technically it's a kind of cavity wall but but you could also say it's a massive load-bearing structure there are no joints there are no um, expansion joints and such things but for Swedish regulations we need to have um, insulation thermal insulation so but actually the walls are 88 centimeters in thickness and then there's a 
and there's a, a cavity at the center. Uh, and the, the reason for uh, the client wanted to have brick on the inside, and I said, well, let's do brick on the outside. And then, of course, this massive load-bearing brickwork is not so common, but technically and economically, it's not such a bad thing. So we, we got the, the bidding, and it was quite okay. Uh, but it's, and another thing is that how it's grounded or, or founded, maybe one should say, it's actually then uh, a concrete sockle which is cast directly on the bedrock. There are a few drilled, a few holes and some steel rods, and then the casting is done straight on top of that, and then the building, the brickwork starts from that, and then it's sort of crowned by an in situ cast um, uh, roof or top. What you see is the church is not a big space. It's by, by 14 by 14 meters on the inside. And this is the sacristy. So here is how it's sort of linked to the existing. There was an existing uh, entry hall to the parish building at this point. Uh, and that sort of then doubled with a new building. And my condition, one could say, when merging the two was that it should not only be one entry at the existing place, but also a separate entrance from the west. And, you know, this is the, the traditional entering uh, direction for the church, and uh, we call it the weapons house, where the, you were supposed to leave your weapons. And the sacristy is here, and uh, the children's little chapel. So it's a very tiny it's a small church, but maybe the size here comes somewhat from the relations of these even smaller spaces. This, the children's chapel is sort of open to the, to the church. And as this, that is so very small, the, 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 maybe the church acquires somewhat more uh, prominence. There's another little, uh, cha um, little, very small chapel there, the Chapel of Stillness with a little light well bringing down light just across this very small altar. Uh, you can see the, this is the existing. This was a wonderful building with its, uh, it's pretty trivial in technical terms, but it does have one wonderful feature, which is this atrium courtyard, which is very much used. And so there were many good reasons for merging them because it created in a way a more complex building. My initial idea about a separate uh, volume, I think, this is more interesting, it turns more into a kind of monastery or a cloister where there are sort of big spaces, small spaces, high spaces, and this, of course, the church is considerably higher than the existing, which is, which is a very low ceiling thing. And I had many ideas about bringing down light from above, and some, should we say, you know, there are baroque, the Baroque solutions with bringing down light from an a hidden light source and so on. But as I worked on the, the project, more and more I felt that those that interesting ceiling with all its light wells and so on turned uh, became slightly too interesting. It sort of took the focus because again, to do a church appropriately, what you what are you there for? You're there for the ceremonies. You're gonna baptize your child, you're gonna bury your your elders or whatever it is. So then how do you achieve a space which really focuses in the best way on that? And I felt these other things were interesting, but it was not an art gallery and I felt I didn't want to do things that took the attention. So finally I, I tested doing very sort of ordinary windows, um, though the ordinariness uh, is maybe, you could discuss it because they're very large, they're five meters high in one pane, so they're, they're, and the only thing that is kept from the, from the intricacy of the skylights is actually the niches that are on the sides that sort of make something to the light that comes in. So there's a double layer, even the wind, the opening in the plan is actually smaller on the inside than on the outside. And then I had these problems with, should there be one beam at the center, should there be a, and it feels like somewhat too symmetrical or austere. I even tested should there be two beams in each direction, but that turned into a nine square arrangement in the ceiling plan, which again seemed somewhat too, too symmetrical to me, too uh, strict. And I, 
uh, I sort of calculated into the problem and, and tested just doing some kind of like when you're on holiday, you come to a barn in the woods, which is sort of falling together. And I tested that could, could we do just some odd, odd uh, beams like this? And this was what finally what was done. Um, and then one more thing, there is a, there is a, this is more or less uh, conceived as a kind of space, almost as if it could be an a orthodox uh, space where there is no seating, just a standing congregation. But I did one bench which sort of follows the walls all around the space. So you could take away those stackable uh, benches that we designed. You could move them elsewhere. And then you could just sit on the sides. And two, two um, things are fixed to the ground, to the floor, the font and the altar. You know, some early studies, well, not so early because there was a, some months of, of, in, in, of skylights before and there were more windows on the sides. Finally, they turned into just be two on two sides and one on north and west, north and uh, south. And here is this idea about the, the benches that has to do also with the profiling and then this relatively boxy interior. I felt this kind of creating a kind of relief or, or a kind of profile on the wall was quite important. So the, the ceiling goes over into this bench, which then goes off to a shelf there where there could be candles, and then it opens into this, the windows that are sort of 280 by 5 or something like this. And then there's a brick floor, the Columba brick actually tessellated into, or the, with a, the Swedish marble that is the foundation for the font. So here again, glazed, glazed bricks, standard Danish bricks that has perforations uh, for, so we've, we found the ones with the most perforations for the reverb, for the choirs singing and so on. And, but we found and we brought these Danish standard bricks into a Swedish uh, company who glazed them. So we have quite a bit of perforation on the walls. In, in Sweden, in the, there were wonderful churches by, of course, Sigurd Leverens and others during the 50s and, and so on. And they sometimes, you know, separated the bricks so there were slits in between bricks and that was a kind of quite a sometimes quite dark interiors that had a very romantic um, atmosphere and I felt that it would be interesting to try to do it in a sort of a tectonic way rather than, than um, in that, uh, that other characters so therefore we choose to have, have holes and in their ceiling you will you may see the whole ceiling is perforated with with lines of holes uh, 80 millimeters in diameter, also for the, for the sound. Here are these recesses by the windows uh, that are actually almost, it's almost like you could, as a person, you could sort of hide in this, um, in the window. I mean, they have some almost, what should you say, body-like um, measures. Um, there were discussions about having a curtain as well, but I felt it was better just just to have the, the uh, profiling, making something with a light. So here is actually the the uh, foundation on the bedrock, mm -hmm. and then the wall with its insulation. And of course, the funny thing is that the insulation will. Though it's regulated, you have to have it, but the insulation will, may last uh, 50 years or whatever. And, but the, the masonry could last 500, so what's the purpose? Um, I mean, and uh, yeah. So, so here you see, the, as I said, the, almost the rest of the, what was left of these intricate skylights and the ceiling is these niches around the, um, the windows. And the, the panes are actually just in one pane uh, resting on the, the bottom and just with a few steel things fitted to the masonry. And then this is cast in situ, 200 tons in one day. It was quite an impressive uh, casting. And then there are some 4,000 4, holes with sound insulation on top.
So this is the entry for from the west. And this is, well, when you do enter here, the sacristy is there, the inside of the church. And the, the bell tower and the, the rock is to the left. And, and this is a space which is the, the made larger entry foyer, which I had a problem and an interesting question. There was the existing f entry foyer of the parish building, which had a suspended wooden sort of whitewashed ceiling that wasn't particularly interesting. And I felt, should I take that down and make the, should I sort of um, take that down and make a concrete, just a rough concrete uh, in the existing and the new to make them be the same. But that felt like being a too, too picky on what, all, what was already there, also costly. But also, on the other hand, bringing, making our new building with a suspended wooden ceiling that you didn't particularly like was also felt inappropriate in some way. So finally, I, I settled on doing casting, letting the existing, uh, the, the neighboring, that's where the photographer stands, this the wooden suspended ceiling, letting that be just as it was, and, but continuing on the same uh, height, the same level, with a concrete cast to forms that were boards of the same profile uh, as the, the, um, the wood. And so for if you come here as a visitor uh, going to church, you, will, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't uh, at first realize that there are different things, but one is concrete and one is wood. And the ambition, of course, from, from me was to sort of retain the integrity of what was there, but also keep the integrity of what was new, not to sort of adapting that to the, to the existing in some unnecessary way. So I think they're different, but they merge together in, in a quite an interesting way. And so you see a profiling, but this looks really like the wooden. So this combination, I'm, I was quite happy. And that was the ambition, not to sort of stress what is new, what is old, but of course, in 10 years time, who cares what was built first? It's sort of how it works in total that really counts. The small, the well, not so small. The all the openings in the in the ceiling. And then finally, there's this tiny little chapel for the for the children, which is a, a space which is open with a door to the to the church but not, um, it could also be closed off, so it's, it's really connected. And there I did some pieces of furniture which was meant, um, of course there are wonderful chairs for kids, Alvaralto's chairs, but they're relatively advanced, they're sort of bent wood, you know, Tony and all that. That's, I felt it was interesting to do a super simple kind of elementary chair that almost a kid could say to their parent when they left that, can we not do this when at home when we come home? Because it's you know it's this the the leg is 42 millimeters in diameter, and all the the others are 21, and there's a piece of hide just over on top. So it's extremely uh, elementary, and um, but still is large enough for an adult to sit, and. Uh, but also it has a ladder-like quality of these, so the very small children can climb up. And um, so this was an interesting project that the, the client, as small as the building was, we were, we were led to do many things, of the, also the detailing of the cross and the, the font and those things. So finally, into the crematorium which is located on this World Heritage Site, which is the Woodland Cemetery in Stockholm. And of course, the Woodland Cemetery was a competition in uh, 1915, which was won by two young architects, uh, Gunnar Asplund and Sigurd Leverens. And uh, they developed it together until, unfortunately, uh, Sigurd Leverens was expelled in the mid-30s, probably from the client feeling that he was too too difficult or too um, ambitious about the work. We don't, we don't really know, but there was a, there was a, what do you say, Asplund had to choose either to do it himself or he would be, he would be, there was an ultimatum to him. And of course, it was a very difficult situation and they, they never 
became friends after, and unfortunately also Asplund died shortly after the, the crematorium, the main building, was finished. But they developed it really together from 1915 and onwards. And Leverens then did, as you may know, the landscaping. And this was vast areas just in the outskirts of Stockholm, which was a sand, sort of a gravel resource. So what they did was sort of rearranging the masses of that into this kind of uh, landscape. And, uh, it's, but it started somewhat differently in a kind of national romantic vein, which then acquired maybe a more sort of classical or Mediterranean character. But the, and actually it's a municipal uh, burial ground. It's not um, a cemetery of the, the Swedish church. So this cross that is here is actually, it was a donation just when it was being inaugurated and the client or the city didn't sort of uh, refrain from that. So, but that's a bit odd. Um, but just maybe a word on a woodland cemetery, which is, you know, for hundreds of years, cemeteries were, I mean, this is, I guess, Highgate in London, but, but there was this, uh, the city of the dead was a concept in cemeteries for a long, long time. And these, these, uh, large mausoleums that were prominent uh, sort of buildings in these cities of the dead. That was a very common theme until around eight, around this time, actually 18 something, when uh, romanticism changed the aspect and of course also the, the, um, the look on nature uh, changed. And uh, of course this Kaspar David Friedrich, this painting from 1820 something is could said to be fitting with that um, temperament. And uh, if Leverence and Asplund was um, inspired by that, we don't really know. But, but that's the fact that we have this hill of remembrance just outside this main chapel. But, you know, there was a trend in the late 19th century, um, late 19th century about doing woodland cemeteries. There's a famous one in Davos in Switzerland, which is relatively contemporary to this. But this was begun, as I said, in 1915. The first chapel, though, uh, was by Asplund. The main chapel, nobody, I don't think the client and the architects could really make up their minds on how, because it was meant to be also a crematorium, how that could be done. So they started with a small chapel, the forest chapel, as you may know. But this is how the character is. It's pretty, there are no mausoleums as in other um, Swedish cemeteries but there are relatively low uh, tombstones. Um, and of course, the, the pines is mostly pines. And this is the plan of the major 1940 uh, three chapels and the crematorium. And the new building that I designed is just, just in the wildwood section of the, crema of the cemetery. Whereas the, the major, the first work by Asplund, this forest chapel is over here. Then further off is a little interesting, the service building that he designed slightly afterwards. But the major uh, Leverance building, the Resurrection Chapel is just here in line with this hill of remembrance, the, the path of seven wells, as it's called. There are some wells along the way. So this is a plan of Asplund's office from from the time of finishing that. So this unfortunately is turned, I see, upside down. But so here's that main, here's the new crematorium. Here is the forest chapel. Here is the service buildings. And this is the, the resurrection chapel. So this is about 1919. The Carl Millis angel of death and uh, so this is still a kind of national romantic uh, character, uh, slightly different from the, the, the other works. And what inspired me in some way, now I've, of course I knew these buildings quite well, and, but when I went back there to do sort of research for the, this actual, this competition, the crematorium was a competition in 2009 by invitation. So there were some Caruso Sinjin from Britain was invited and there was Tadao Ando from Japan and there was an, a number of different people. But then I went back and I saw one, bu one uh, building, if you could say, so this, what we call the sort of corpses cellar 
next to the Aspland Forest Chapel that somehow uh, I looked upon with other eyes than before. And this, of course, is the Resurrection Chapel by, by uh, um, Leverance, which you reach from the, from the north, from these path of the seven wells, the main entry, uh, and then you go into the altar, or the, the, um, the, the, co the coffin is to the left, and then you go out the other way to the right, this way. It's with this the cycle of life, in all these chapels there, is, there are two ways, one in and one out, to not do sort of a back and forth movement. And this has a, a very interesting interior, which has also this kind of, it's very austere, certainly, but there is also a very elegant uh, profiling on the walls and so on, but also the detailing in the, in, the, in the floor, for instance, the paving with mosaics has also these patterns, almost a wave. So if you like, you could almost, I mean, you can interpret it as the, the river sticks, and this is Charon's boat being over on its way over to Hades. So there's really, as austere as it is, it still is very rich in how you can interpret it. And again, of course, this building is, I would say, relying on the Erecteion at the Acropolis. This is, to my mind, must have been one of the many, of course, he was also inspired by Schinkel, but this is really worth visiting. Um, and it's actually also very much used. All these small chapels are used continuously. Has this skewed? This, as you see, is slightly skewed to the to the the, um, the major part of the building. So this is the major chapel from, or the chapels and crematorium by Asplund himself. And here you go into the side, to the waiting room, and then from the side you reach the chapel, and then you leave once the the, the burial the, is is. Over, you walk out in the main opening. So this is the plan of this, with a major chapel, two smaller ones that are the best, I would say, that has some wonderful small courtyards that are next to these there's waiting rooms. You could overlook the courtyards where you could go out. So you would walk in to them, and then you go into the chapel like this, and then there's the ceremony, and you go out. But on the back side, slightly on a lower level, so you could actually, with an elevator, bring the coffins from, from these positions straight down into this, this um, um, crematorium. So that's the existing, which existed, or still exists, and it's used, some of the cold stores are used, but the building is, the new building is now working, and that is located in a, this wildwood section of the cemetery where all the, the trees are really sort of, uh, completely unordered, or were, um, and there was a clearing at the at the at this section of the wood, and I suggested putting the building as far off from the road as possible, so you, as a mourner, could actually prepare yourself for what you were going to experience there by walking up on these these um, pavings that are sort of laid out. There's no garden, obviously, but and there's a pretty industrial kind of building in certain ways but of course it also has a, a public role so I felt that these pavings could be a sign of sort of a civilized sign in this relatively rough wood and here the the, the brickwork on is all on the walls as well as the the, uh, uh, the facades as well as the roof and the plan so here is the the public entrance with a very tiny entrance hall and a little ceremony room where you could bid uh, the deceased farewell in the coffin or be here for a ceremony when you fetch the urn. And here is the major hall for the incinerators. So the mourners would go up here to this direction and the cars, the undertaker's cars would drive through here, leave the coffin and take it into the cold stores over here and then the car would drive out. And then for the for the personnel, there is a courtyard where they can have a coffee or so without sort of meeting the, the mourners. So already in the competition, I had this idea about an interior that would be light and somehow with a, should we say, kind of clemency to, the, to those working, because it is a pretty difficult uh, 
environment, I would say. And these are the, oops, uh, so these are the incinerators before they're clad in a, unfortunately, slightly too shiny stainless steel. But the, this competition entry was, a, as opposed to most of the other schemes, it was quite a little of windows. The Ando scheme was completely glazed. Bjarke Ingels was also very much glazed. Even Caruso Sinjin had a row of sort of œil de boeuf along the sides. So, but I hope the, the windows here bring down light on the walls to have the, so this kind of reflection that gives light to the space anyway. Um, but you, so there are two major openings in the, in the roof. There are some four, 40 long, and there are two major windows from which you could, through which you could see sort of out into the woods. You can see if there is uh, wind or a fox running by or whatever. It, so you can get some contact with the, but also as a passerby, because this is a municipal territory, it's not sort of closed off. You can actually see into the building and see that what, takes place there is not something that is hidden or sort of scary, but well, it could be scary, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of something which is not uh, hidden. And then here is this courtyard and a tiny slit that bringing them down light to this, to this um, ceremony room and this daylight to the, 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 uh, the, um, where the coffins are brought in. So it's very close to the, the major Asplund building, and these are the open spaces, and here are the suburbs of the south of Stockholm. So the studies for this was really getting, understand what should be here, and it's, and, you know, in Sweden, winter time or it can be very dark and quite lonely in a, in, a, in a wood like this, so I felt it was good to walk along the driveway for the undertaker's cars but then go off into the to the uh, to the building and i didn't know at this time at all the character of that but there was also sort of bedrock or an undulating terrain that the building could somehow relate to and early on i studied sort of very linear long buildings just which was actually what just what caruso sinjin uh, uh, proposed but i finally found that there are only four or five people working in the building so uh, it would be more uh, better to have a more compact building where they could overlook things in a more block-like. And then I tested many solutions. Where should the mourners, when they come, should they be able to go out? Should there be a kind of courtyard? Should the cars, undertakers' cars, should they be into some kind of secluded space? But a courtyard in our climate can frequently, I mean, in Spain, such things work, but here it's or with us, it tends to be so damp and rarely become really nice. So finally, I settled on a canopy, which though had a very large opening in the, in the um, ceiling for to, because there was a one giant pine that could be kept and the client wanted to keep as many trees as possible. This says something about the terrain and you would actually walk from the street up to the building, reaching this quite large canopy and there were many studies of really on the plan i worked months on the plan to make it as compact and as efficient as possible and here was another kind of courtyard and finally i reached a kind of speaking of speaking of uh, poetry or meters or rhymes you know rhyme being something frequently used in in poems but the rhyme can be a very sort of easy way to get connection between sentences whereas what really keeps it going is the meter, I would say. And, but I, for, a, for a while, I understood that maybe this courtyard and the opening in this canopy could have the same size. That gave me some kind of rhyme for a while in, the, in working on the project. So that was what actually was what we entered with in the competition, these two openings to the sky being of the same shape, eight by five or something. And under this, this large space for the, for the mourners if they would go out. And then what about the, the, the roof? I tested many solutions about skylights of different kinds. And, but again, it was not an art gallery. It's not a very public building. So finally, I just uh, skipped that and made it into a kind of shed-like structure, more like an industry or a, a stone in the forest, which was 
finally the motto that I gave this anonymous uh, proposal, just with one ridge here and just some kind of roof stretching over the complete thing and then the openings. Um, that is finally what is the, the high, this, this space should be, the, the incinerator hall should be the highest, 6.5 meters or so. And finally I settled on the ridge there and there's a large roof stretching all the way down to the, where the cars come in and then a tiny roof the other direction. So it's, it's not a stone of course, but it's, it's, it's a very um, embracing kind of roof. And the interior is very, very much divided into four parts, where well, this is the public and this is the, the loading area. And then here around this courtyard is really where the, the people are working, that they can go out and without sort of meeting those who are there in mourning. And the building is then set into this clearing and you reach it through this street and then, or road and then go off. And this was com from the competition uh, images that were a tiny bit of Photoshop, but in, in really uh, large one to, 20, um, one to 20 models with actual copper on the sides of the, sometimes we take them out into the, to the um, what do you say, outside to photograph, but this is actually not true. We didn't have the time <laughs> so this, but uh, so that's the courtyard and the, and the stone in the forest we retrieved during the construction process. We took some stones, put them on the side of the, of the building and then brought them back, as you will see later on. That was already the idea at this stage. And then the building has, of course, there's an incredible amount of heat produced and there's uh, fresh air coming in on this side of the building and then being going up to the air uh, through the roof. But of course, we do as frequently we do large-scale prototypes to test uh, materials and such. And the, the climate is not the best at times. And still, we needed to have to show this to the authorities. So, but uh, a little later, it looked like this. And there we tested. So we had some kind of grill for the fresh air, actually a grill in brick. And uh, this is the, uh, the this Columba brick, as I mentioned, that was developed by Tsumtu. And that's a very typical, uh, this, this is how the surroundings are. It's a pretty, uh, pretty rough uh, Swedish wood. And this is this grill and brick all to the, on the southern side. And these are Cortain uh, grills where they, uh, it goes out the uh, air. And this is a very wide, 11 meter wide Cortain steel uh, sliding door where the cars drive out. <coughs> the major entry, which is a very wide, there's a granite column, instead of this keeping this pine tree that was there, and I felt that it would be better to sort of strengthen the building, because originally there had been a, as in this image, there were, there you, the sketch you saw, may have seen, uh, there was a large um, pine, but now this is more like a petrified tree with a sort of granite, actually a load-bearing granite column, on the inside of this canopy. And the canopy then has a slit bringing down light on the wall behind those figures. So that's this position. And in a way it's like the, the terrain comes into the building and this is a large, a very sort of almost overscaled opening, which is not for the public. Well, if there would be a royal cremation maybe, but it's, but I, don't, I, I doubt it will. But, uh, but, they, but people go in this way, but I felt it would be of some interest that they've actually stated on this wall that there is some kind of uh, permeability or something uh, sort of here. So this is a copper door uh, giving a sign of that something happens there. And as I said, this is the tiny slit bringing down light in the, in the ceremony room. So here the coffins are loaded into the cold stores and then straight into the, the uh, incinerators. And of course there's a lot of things happening underground as well. <coughs> and this is then the tiny courtyard which has a sort of a corridor all along its sides and a glazing all along. So there are no columns there, it's sort of a beams um, stretching down and then 
actually the corridor then has different heights and different corners because it sort of follows the outer the outer roof so as you see it's really a, a wood around and this is this rock that sort of rises in the ground but on the other side there's a ceremony a cemetery and so this is really a it was probably meant by Aspen to be a kind of backdrop to the main crematorium, this wildwood uh, part. There are a few spaces for those working in the manager's office. We're overlooking the mourner's path, but also overlooking into this courtyard with the boulders. And that for those interested in the technicalities this is the structure the white concrete so i wanted again to test a very sort of mild character on the inside so it's all white concrete and luckily we had the the, the contractor skanska who are very powerful and got the job they of course early on said that no that cannot be done that's not possible luckily we've done this private house that you saw previously and we we said we brought them there and then they got challenged, so they went into this pool space, which was all white, and they said, hmm, well, this, this is okay, but we could do it much better. So they were, then they were, <laughs> luckily, luckily we got them sort of into doing it. But it was quite tricky because some of these spaces are very high, and getting a perfect surface of the concrete when you have a seven meter wall, and you know, getting the sort of drill to get the, uh, the concrete out to the formwork, in, in between the uh, steel, the uh, reinforcements is quite difficult. But the sorry, the, um, the the structure is a so this is the white concrete, uh, and on top of that is um, foam glass insulation. And then there's the membrane, and then there's another concrete uh, on top, and then there's mortar, and then there's the bricks. And the bricks are extraordinary; they are very hard burn, so they, there's no um, and then there are some channels for the water along the sides of the, the building. And um, yeah. And then there's a few openings and there actually the, the windows are flush with, the, with the, the paving. I mean technically you could look upon the roof as a kind of terrace. So this is how these canals look. So the third stone, the third brick from from the out from the perimeter of the building are sort of taken away and, and turned into a canal. And here is this uh, um, the reinforced um, openings for the fresh air, as I mentioned earlier. And here are the under this canopy. There are uh, so that's the most willful. There is the most willful arrangement of the brick. You could say that this building has a cladding of brick compared to the church, which is much more, uh, not orthodox, but it's more elementary. This is really a uh, contemporary cladding of brick on top of a, uh, though, uh, in situ cast structure. But under the canopy, there are really a kind of willful arrangement of bricks because the bricks are even sort of cast into the, to the concrete. But and as the unorthodox character you can see here, to get this very wide stretch of this canopy, which I felt was important, there are quite a bit of steel there as well. And these uh, piers of concrete here. And these are some of these very large models that we did. Also too for the, for the, the Skanska to show the intentions. And here, as I said, you have bricks on the on the edge side actually that you walk on and on the flat side as on the roof and here are actually the bricks laid straight into the ground so they will grow here and there is this large um, opening and the client was somewhat felt that this was too large but I felt it was quite important that they have a great generosity of this space there could be two groups of people here, and and you know the building is quite large, and the wood is somewhat uh, difficult too at times. So the generosity of the space was quite important. And this is the roof, which is quite impressive. Walking, I I've said sometimes it's almost walking there felt almost like you're how it could be to walk on the back of a whale or something. It's really a, a very odd odd surface right into the the wood 
and uh, we try to the uh, where the, the the bricks meet. We try to not do too many cut bricks, but rather having sort of wider um, I don't know gaps between the, the bricks. So this again is this small slit to the ceremony room, and this is actually the the courtyard, the atrium. Uh, actually, so the, the the window is actually following the um, the roof, which was somewhat tricky, but uh, can could be done. <laughs> um, this is actually the photographer Joanna Marinesco. You may know, London-based uh, photographer. So here are all these. Here are the bricks. There is sort of green rising through the bricks now. And this can be opened. This was not asked for in the brief, but the client was embraced it actually later on in the process because they realized they could even bring in machinery through that large door. And there's some small places where you can meet the managers and receive the urn and do some, some sort of paperwork. And they can really overlook the people coming and they could also overlook through this courtyard, diagonal through this atrium, they could overlook also the, the coffins coming in. And the, to me, the, con the confirmation on that this was an adequate place for this public entry was actually that there's a, there's a tree there, a leaf tree, here you see it, a leaf tree, a golden rain, as it's called in Sweden, which really felt like it was sort of confirmed that this was a, a good position because otherwise it's only fir trees. There are pines and... Uh, I don't know what you call them, Christmas trees, but there are really no, very little of leaf trees, but here's one. So it sort of give, gave some mild sort of uh, comfort to this place. But uh, uh, around on the other side is really close to the wood, as you see. <coughs> on the inside then, as I said, the, the concrete work is, is, I've already mentioned, but it's also for the sound insulation, we have again used these bricks, these perforated bricks, then differently from the church where they were part of the load-bearing wall, though being a surface, but they were actually built together with the masonry. Here they are cladding on top of the concrete wall, and they're also done with no uh, sliding joints, I don't know the word. But Again, this thing about not many windows, but being positioned just here, they, the reflection from the glazing is quite important in the, in the space. The floor, which gives some dignity, I think, to the interior, is a Swedish marble in quite large uh, sizes, which is quite matte. I didn't want too much of a kind of hotel in atmosphere, so it's actually a mat, it's called diamond blasted. It's relatively matte as a surface. And, and here at the corner is this small ceremony room, which um, either you can come here for a ceremony to, to fetch the urn uh, after the cremation, you could also put a coffin there and have a ceremony. But it's also that this space is, you can be there and you can be present while someone is being cremated. So then you could slide uh, away this textile that hangs there. You could stand behind this large opening. You could even walk in if you're allowed. But you also need to have a, this large opening so a truck could come in and take a fork, sort of forklift could come and take out the coffin. Um, but this is a, quite a small, so this is the, the public part, in fact of the building. And then the, the as, as large as it is, it's about 40 by 40 meters, you could still see, I tried to make some stretches through the building, you could actually come in from, the, so here we are in the staff entrance, you could see straight through passing the atrium and then through the furnace hall over to the other side. So transparency may not be the word, but still there are vistas through the building. And this is then the courtyard, which has these corridors of different heights. So that's a pretty varied space. 
And that's, as I said, where the, the cars are driving out. And um, the, uh, it's a pretty, as you see, it's a pretty rough uh, environment with the wood and the, the, the asphalt and many things. Uh, in contrast to the church previously, there we had much more control of the detailing and so on. And here we did not in many details. So there's a certain roughness. And I also they asked, should this be taken away? I felt that could be, this also is quite a bit of an industrial facility, this. So keeping, not trying to make it too pretty was part of the idea. And of course, you still have to come out from, the, it takes a while before that slides up. If there's a fire, you should be able to escape. So. So this is the, of course, this building is uh, the, the most well-known probably of the ones that I, I showed. And uh, again, I, I spoke about plans and meters and I, I really developed it as much as some of the detailing is of importance and it was tested before in the church and so on. I, I felt that the, the plan, the, the crucial thing for the building was sort of done with a relatively small paper or sketches and then all these ideas about the spaces a few the the curvature of the ceiling of the ceremony room and and the other kind of ceilings but most of the work were actually done in the plan and then of course we had to develop the details but that is in some way uh, not secondary but it's it's uh, the plan work particularly on this work was really dominant and i think we won the competition also by it being efficient though of course the efficiency that the client liked was of course i looked upon as a prerequisite in a way for for the work but to me what was more interesting was the getting a kind of a labyrinthic quality or getting a kind of quality of a almost of a painting if i as I admire as i admire the paintings of say giorgio morandi or you know the kind of abstraction in the plan sort of being completely abstract but also being completely useful into this kind of joining of, of these two aspects of work is something that interests me a lot and keeps the kind of freedom, gives a kind of free space in the work I think when you have a plan which is really um, that you can develop without saying how it should look. Though certainly I have continuously many ideas about how it looks. So. Uh, but I think that's what, when it, when it comes to the meters in a poem, it's, I think, of course, a poem is never, just like a plan doesn't make, that's not the only thing in a building, but it's very important. And you can say, if you have a good plan, you have a good chance of, of doing it well. But it's never, and if you have a good meter, just like if you have a good drummer in a, in a, with a lousy guitarist, you could still sort of get going. And I think, I think it's, uh, so to me that, that aspect is quite interesting and uh, with the meters if you read Dante, the, the comedy or whatever, I think that aspect has, has some, some strong relevance to my work and I, I could maybe even finish if I, if I now, after all these words, can remember, I could see if I could quote this, you know, I mentioned W.H. Auden whom I think is such a profound thinker and, and poet who who wrote pieces in so many uh, in so many meters and uh, free verse and he I mean being in Ireland in a way one should quote he wrote a wonderful poem on the uh, it was called the memory of uh, W.B. Yeats when he died it's a wonderful poem but it doesn't touch it's sort of free verse in the beginning so I could say I could quote another which I think is very interesting which deals with something similar to architecture architecture is such a complex matter I mean it deals with economy it deals with culture it deals with technicalities and uh, nature so many things and and this poem which is called the shield of Achilles is a poem which is interesting because it deals with, it was written I think in 1950 or around that year, um, just after the Second World War. And you sense very clearly how he writes about the dictators or, or the, the tyrants of that time and the atrocities of war. 
but as the title is the uh, the shield of achilles it deals as much with the trojan war of course from the iliad and you know with the achilles the the war hero and his shield of course for a warrior before there were cars or horses and i mean the the, the spike and the, the shield i guess was the most important thing for a warrior and the they were obviously done very beautifully. If you were a rich warrior, you had a very fine shield. If you were not, it was simple. And um, <clears throat> so this, this poem uh, touches on contemporary things, very ancient things, and, uh, and it all is driven through with the hexameter uh, that sort of is through, you know, that's the, the meter that is used for epic usually, and it's uh, somewhat long, but uh, I'll see if I can read it. And you will hear that here and there, I mean, he even quotes, he uh, quotes Shakespeare and some parts. So it's, it's very rich in its uh, allusions and associations to other things and the contemporary. And, and you will hear a scene where three, three people are brought forward three to, uh, and put to three posts uh, put in the ground. It's almost like a crucifixion scene. And it's, so it's very rich. And I'll see if I can remember it. <clears throat> Uh, so, so the shield of Achilles, um, and it's the, the, the it, it really is a text that where Tethys, the mother of Achilles, looks over the shoulder of the the, um, the smith, the uh, the welder uh, Hephaestus, you know, the god of of, uh, of Smith and. Um, he, uh, she looks over his shoulder and he, she expects certain things and she sees completely different things. So she looked over his shoulder for vines and olive trees, for marble well-governed cities, for ships on untamed seas. But there upon his shining metal, his hands had put instead an artificial wilderness and a sky like lead. A plain without a feature, bare and brown, no blade of grass, no sign of neighborhood, nothing to eat and nowhere to sit down. Yet congregated on his blankness stood an unintelligible multitude, a million eyes, a million boots in line, without expression, waiting for a sign. Out of the air, a voice without a face, proved by statistics that some cause was just, in tones and dr as dry and level as the place, no one was cheered, Nothing was discussed, column by column, in a cloud of dust. They marched away, and during a belief whose logic brought them somewhere else, to grief. She looked over his shoulder for ritual pieties, for white flower garlanded heifers, libation and sacrifice. But there upon his shining metal, where the altar should have been, she saw by his flickering forchlight quite another scene. Barbed wire enclosed an arbitrary spot where bored officials lounged, one cracked a joke, and the sentries sweated as the day was hot. A crowd of ordinary decent folk watched from without and neither moved nor spoke as three pale figures were let forth and bound to three posts driven upright in the ground. The mass and majesty of this world, all that carries weight and weighs the same, lay in the hands of others. They were small and could not hope for help, and no help came. What their foes liked to do was done. Their shame was all the worst could wish. They lost their pride and died as men before their bodies died. She looked over his shoulder for athletes at their games, men and women in a dance, moving their sweet limbs, quick, quick to music. But there upon his shining shield, he had set no dancing floor, but a weed-choked field. A ragged urchin, aimless and alone, loitered about that vacancy. A bird flew up to safety from his well-aimed stone. Um, that girls are raped, that two boys knife a third, were axioms to him who'd never heard of any world where promises were kept. Or one could weep because another wept. The thin-lipped armor Hephaestus hobbled away. Thetis of the shining breasts cried out in dismay at what the god had wrought to please her son, 
a strong, iron-hearted, man-slaying Achilles who would not live long. Yeah. Thank you. Just say what a beautiful way to finish the lecture. Um, a really a, a lecture that was a real pleasure to listen to. So thanks very much. Um, we have very little time, but if uh, question from the audience, maybe if people are ready, um, I might just have one. Just one question. Am I right about the um, the cemetery there? That the competition came about because um, the the existing Aspland. Um, crematorium was kind of out of use or yes. had fallen out of use. Yes. Um, you, you had that line about um, in your essay that all buildings should be built to last. Um, and kind of in that context of, uh, of when you're working in that kind of uh, very heritage heavy um, uh, site, uh, what, did that influence you in any way in, in, in kind yes. of keeping that in many, mind? About many people have asked me that. Um, um, and Ellis Woodman, who asked me that a while ago when he was there, uh, I must say to me, the um, I think the being from Stockholm, I knew the place slightly better than the foreigners, of course. But I think that to me, focusing on the actual, the um, what the building should do, uh, if it was through the plan, but also trying to understand what should happen there, and. That was a kind of, um, you say, antidote to the to the to being too sort of uh, influenced, or because there's no way how could you relate the building to to um, the existing buildings and all their qualities. So to me, I was I was really focusing on that. Then, and I for, maybe forgot to tell that, and the students and uh, young people particularly seem to think it's sort of cool that it's sort of heavy and there's brick and everything. But to me, the, the, I worked on the plan and it was only at the very end or relative or end, but relatively late that I selected brick as the surface. It could well have been uh, concrete, but think about it. I mean, it's, it could almost look like a bunker and, or, a, or a stealth had landed. So I, and I felt that concrete it would be sort of too strong. It would be a, a too kind of bunker-like structure. Whereas the bricks, the sort of the hand quality of the brick, and it's not. It was not a question of tradition of brick, and the, but it was really that the bricks somehow fitted to the bark of the on the trunks of the pines. That was sort of, and also it felt that it was the smallest possible element that could be there. That so, and it was really. Uh, considerably late that I choose brick in the in this uh, for the exterior. Uh, I had the idea. I mean, I. But that's the good thing about being completely focused on the practicalities. But then trying to bring in practicalities into this abstract life of the, the plan. So, but uh, I um, I didn't much. Um, Care about well, I cared about the extent, but and someone mentioned that the this building has some relation to the later Leverens buildings that are not in the cemetery, and it's perfectly true. And I don't mind, and I don't just like, I mean, uh, that some people can accuse me or say that your buildings look like someone else. I mean, you cannot, we cannot do sort of brand new buildings all the time. So as long as they're good enough. What they're doing, they, I mean, we all relate to other things. So, and you could, the, the crematorium certainly is related to Klippan or to the, but I don't care. And it's, it's, uh, yeah. So that Marler line, the carrying the fire forward, is less appropriate for that building maybe than the one the church you showed before. Sorry, I didn't. That, the Marler line about carrying the fire forward. It's less appropriate for that the cemetery than, or for the crematorium. I than think for it's. I think it's as appropriate for both of them. But but there's. I would say that it's the 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 cladding of a building is something that I. 
I mean, I care. I think it's interesting how things look, but in some way, it's 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 secondary to many other things. And this, I think, if this building is relevant in this way, it could probably be re relevant in another way too. It's just that I didn't want it to be one big uh, concrete bunker, yeah. and cladding it with wood would have been slightly awkward. So, so, but I'm not saying that it could have been clad in different, but economically, technically, and relating to the trunks, I felt the brick was good. And then that it also then had some, um, that it had some um, relation to, to Klippan or to Levens. I mean, that would be embarrassing if I would choose then to use it not to yeah. be, what do you say, guilty by association or anything, so. And is there anyone, other, anyone else have a question um, before we wrap it up? Upstairs. Yeah, very long already. It's always, always so good. Um, okay, if um, if no one has any questions, we'll finish there. Um, so just again, um, give a thank you. Um, so thanks all for coming, um, and we have a lecture again same time next week. Thanks.